Hi, everyone. Uh, I hope you all had a good week. Sorry for the couple of minutes of delay. Turns out that Caesars Forum <laughs> two things in Vegas, so <laughs> I had to run, to run across. Uh, hope you had a great reInvent week. I hope you enjoyed yourself last night, hopefully, in replay. And thanks for braving the early morning session of Friday. Uh, great to have you all here. My name is George Eliseos. I'm the director of product management for our AWS EC2 edge computing services. And I'm joined today by Jill Stoddart. I am. Is my mic on? Yeah, you're on. Okay. <laughs> I am Jill Stoddart. I'm a principal product manager for our AWS Wavelength service, and I work with a lot of our 5G partners. Thanks, Jill. <clears throat> so we got a lot to cover today, so we're going to move a little bit fast. Um, there's been a lot of great announcements this week, and we want to cover most of them. Um, uh, so we'd like to take you through how AWS builders use the power of AWS Edge and Hybrid to build and innovate um, for, their, for their own customers and to create business value for other businesses. Um, but a lot has been said about the edge, and you know, there's multiple edges, such an overloaded term. So we'd like to start by giving you a little bit of a background of how we see the edge and hybrid computing. Um, So when we're starting to work back from the customer applications, what we see really is that although it's easy to categorize in your head you know, two very separate things, oh, the cloud and the edge, what we really see is a continuum of application requirements. So applications are not strictly cloud or strictly edge, um, <clears throat> and there is not single <laughs> um, edge that the application need to reside in. So what we see from a customer is that most applications today are very well served by the AWS region, the traditional infrastructure deployment of AWS that consists of you know, multiple availability zones and brings the whole power and elasticity and um, uh, breadth and depth of the AWS platform in, in, in all its, um, uh, its power and uh, feature richness. And you know, when you have <clears throat> applications such as email, collaboration, uh, websites, um, you know, um, uh, business applications, most of these are very well suited by the AWS regions. We've launched um, 25 of those uh, to, to, uh, to this day, and we see the vast majority of applications and customers being well, very well served there. But then we see a number of customers having uh, some special requirements, uh, like, for example, data residency. Data residency is usually imposed on customer requirements because of some regulation or, uh, that, that requires them to run applications locally within a geography within a country or within many times a, a, a data center, a special data center, right? So we see these, these customers kind of needing to deploy cloud services on premises. And then you have another category, which is customers wanting to deploy applications and run their workloads very close to some particular uh, point of interest. Whether it is for local data processing, a lot of you know, the data that's being generated today is not easy to move around. It's either not cost effective or impractical. So you want to run a lot of the applications very close to where the data is actually being generated. And also, you might have specific ultra low latency requirements to your own customers. Uh, this requirements may be imposed either because there is machine-to-machine -machine communications that require very, um, very low latencies um, and very high throughput between the machines, or it may, they may, uh, uh, they may uh, I'm sorry, it's very dry here, <laughs> uh, they may involve human interaction and a number of um, uh, applications that require real-time human interaction require the latency to be driven down. So when you're seeing that application continuum, you see a lot of heterogeneity in the types of applications, the types of requirements. However, there is a number of things that need to stay the same. And the one thing that we found is that in the customer's biggest challenge when they're trying to deploy their applications in different parts of the world or in different, different um, infrastructure is that they need that sameness. That sameness can <clears throat> uh, uh, can range from everything from the same reliable hardware where applications are fine-tuned to run on specific underlying infrastructure, and then if you keep changing that, the application, um, uh, the application performance keeps changing and 
uh, you might run in, in special race conditions, you might run on many di different things that you didn't design for. But also you want the same operational consistency so that you know that the modules, the third party software and your own applications that you've written play well with the, with the underlying infrastructure. And so one of the most central things of that, same, of that sameness theme that we see is also the APIs, the services, and the automation that you, you, you have trained your uh, engineers to use. Once your, your engineering team has spent their time building up, these, um, uh, the, the building up their competencies and knowing how to use something, you want them to be able to not have to do that again and again every time they, they change where they want to deploy, and sometimes even when they change what they want to deploy. So customers want that sameness of the services and APIs, and of course, one of the key things is that they want that same innovation and the speed that's happening in the cloud to translate into their deployment. So our approach is not to take the cloud and try and copy it in different places, but really extend the cloud out so that all of that sameness starting very low down the stack from the hardware all the way up to the monitoring services that you might be using um, is consistent, but also the the uh, innovation that we're doing in the cloud directly transforms into where you're deployed, wherever that is. So if you're looking at the AWS answer to that continuum of application requirements, we're basically building a continuum of the cloud. So instead of having these two buckets of edge and, 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 and centralized cloud, we have this continuum of services. We have the AWS regions, more than 25. We've built AWS local zones that extend the AWS region in major cities industrial centers and bring the same power of the AWS platform. We have more than 16 of those and we announced that we're gonna be building another 30. Um, we have AWS Wavelength that again extends the AWS region into the, the 5G network, bringing you the ability to build low latency applications to, to 5G devices. Uh, and of course, we've built for that on-premises use case that we've been talking about with our Outpost uh, family of products where you can take an Outpost and put it wherever your data center is or wherever your area of interest is, wherever your data is being um, uh, created, and run, uh, run the same AWS that you're, you used and love to. And then you're, when you start thinking going on, on that traditional far edge with the smart devices or the ragged edge where you know, it's an oil rig or it's a boat or somewhere where you, you have to be disconnected, then you, you start going into our IoT and Greengrass and Free Artos and uh, the Ragged Edge with the AWS Snow family. So you see how AWS vision of having AWS anywhere our customers need it is driven by that application continuum. So today, we could take you through an update of all of the things that we've done in these different products, but we thought it would be more interesting to show you how our customers are using these different products to innovate and really really change and disrupt every kind of industry. You have media and entertainment, manufacturing, automotive, telco has been a, a, a really big focus in the last few years, retail, and so on. So I'm gonna, we're gonna look at two or three of those today. I'm gonna uh, pass over to Jill to maybe yep. look at uh, sure. media and entertainment first. Yeah, thanks, George. Let's see if I can, ah. And it's stuck. George? I use the keys. <laughs> okay. Sorry about this, guys. All right. Well, thanks. Um, great to see you today again. Thanks for coming out Friday morning. Um, you know, as George said, we've been launching these edge services. Um, and over the last two years since we launched uh, Outposts and uh, local zones and, and wavelength zones. I would say uh, the, the industry where we've seen the most activity and, and drive to harness the edge and create innovation is with, in, uh, with media and entertainment. And one of the reasons for this is that there's some really powerful shifts happening in this industry over the last few years. If you think about it, how is con content creation has been democratized by this ability for all of us to develop content 
anywhere, at any time, and stream it live. We consume content differently, and it gets distributed to content, to content providers differently as well. And finally, the video producers, their technology and content producers, the technology is changing, their platforms are changing, and all of this is causing the need for rapid innovation in this industry. So I'm going to quickly go through um, at a high level here a few of these use cases, and then we're going to go um, talk about a few of the customers, um, how they've used it, and how they brought together different aspects of um, the, what we've launched over the last few years. So video production at the edge. What this is is really being able to have production workflows um, at, at, you know, perhaps in one area for both post a pre and post embed content that can be able that can you don't have to be in the same have them everybody in the same place they can um, acquire content at an event and then stream it via high speed 5G networks to the nearest wavelength zone and then be able to use that same virtual in in infrastructure to manage that and produce that content this is really important for interactive live events because what you're doing, you know, if you've been to a football game, you normally have big production trucks sitting outside. Um, and now we're taking that, the, they're able to not have to do, uh, have as much of that compute infrastructure there in, in the uh, production truck. And instead, it's in the wavelength zone or in, in the edge uh, with, in, in local zones. Customers like Summit Tech are also creating shared media experiences where viewers can respond in real time um, with interactive elements that might be served up from compute locations. So it's important that we have really powerful compute that can do all of the AI and ML to merge together um, uh, data and statistics and, and objects in real time as we interact with this content. content. So this access to powerful compute infrastructure close to both the production and the consumption at a lower investment cost is what makes it economically viable to experiment with new ways of reaching audiences, engage them, and maybe uncover new ways to monetize this content. And finally, um, Edge Services really enables ultra-responsive gaming to be delivered with low latency anywhere. And we'll talk about uh, a customer of ours that is doing this with AWS. So we have customers like Netflix who want to be able to create content faster. And one of the ways they do this is they wanted to migrate their expensive artist workstations to the cloud. But if you've ever worked with uh, you know, a CAD system or, a, or excuse me, a, a, the artist workstations, they really require uh, low latency, probably less than five milliseconds from their animation hub to the virtual instance. So with AWS local zones in LA connected with Direct Connect, customers like Netflix are able to achieve latencies as low as one to two milliseconds from their office and animation hub to the local zone. So Net, uh, Netflix was able to deliver a better art experience for their artists and create content faster by using local zones. So based on the success of customers like Netflix, we've been expanding local zones in the US. Uh, this week we announced that our new, three newest local zones in Seattle, Atlanta, and Phoenix, and that brings up to a total of 16 zones in the US already. Now, we also announced plans for 30 new local zones across 21 countries starting in 2022. So you can see we're going to be able to bring those benefits out to the edge in all these different large metro areas. Of course, 5G networks play a, a big role in many of these use cases we've been talking about. Wavelength extends AWS infrastructure and services to the edge of 5G networks 
through partnerships that we have with Verizon in the US, KDDI in Japan, SKT in Korea. And this year, we also announced general availability of Wavelength Zone with Vodafone in Europe. And in 2022, we are going to be extending Wavelength Zones with Bell Canada uh, in, in Canada. So to, we'll have some additional locations there. So today, worldwide, we have 17 Wavelength Zones. And uh, that will keep growing over time. So what we've seen with Wavelength Zone is that by bringing this powerful compute to the edge of the 5G network, it's enabling builders to create new ways for consumers to experience these live events. And as I promised, I was in, wanted to have, take you through one customer who's doing this. So Sportable, it's a, a partner that is, uses AWS Wavelength and Vodafone 5G to do a live sporting event. Let's take a look. It's supposed to come. Okay. Rugby is just becoming so competitive. So for WAS to be associated with a company like Vodafone, they're at the cutting edge in terms of data and technology. It's just another way for us to seek that competitive advantage and keep us ahead of the game. We're here with Ross Rugby at their amazing stadium with Sportable who bought their smart ball and that's running on Vodafone Business's distributed edge compute platform powered by AWS Wavelength. The ball itself has electronics inside the ball and that tells us where the ball is and where you guys are at any one time. We've taken the amazing compute capability of AWS and put it at the edge of our network which means we're able to deliver speed of application which has never been available before. Vodafone and AWS work closely with startups transforming user experiences with new mobile applications. These applications require low latency, mobility, and high throughput connectivity. Sportable is a great example where they can now run their software at the mobile edge, delivering real-time insights to coaches, players in the stadium, as well as fans at home. Smart Ball is a project that we've been working on with Gilbert Rugby. It's got a tiny tracking chip embedded within the ball, and that allows us to track the ball in 3D and in real time. So the time from when the event happens on the field to the time that a coach can see it on their laptop or tablet, or for a fan seeing it home, we want to make that as fast as possible. Everything that you're going to see on the screen is directly related to what's happening out in the field. Where Vodafone and AWS come in is their new wavelength technology allows us to speed up the data. We're able to cut the cord, so to speak, so no more cables, no more heavy infrastructure, and that is a saving that we can pass on to our customers. Being able to see the sort of data that the technology can give us is pretty awesome. But yeah, it's the sort of data that we just wouldn't usually get, so from a passing perspective, it's great. Kick one, kick two, and kick three. The grouping is fairly consistent, so we can tell straight off the bat you're a pretty accurate kicker. You know, I really enjoyed today. It shows things like hang time and rotations per second, and things like that can really help with certain parts of my game. To actually have that real-time data has some really exciting implications for how we can improve and enhance our coaching. And if the fans can engage in terms of some of that data, that I think uh, brings the fans more into the game and share the experiences with the players. This is an example where companies can use this technology to deploy new services, and that means that there's lots of public and private sector enterprises who will be able to also scale their businesses. So it's a really exciting thing to be involved with at this time. I guess this is Andy's keynote. Everybody doesn't clap at the end of it. <laughs> I, I find this a pretty uh, inspiring video of um, how customers are using some of our products to build, to build really look for leaning forward applications. Um, and Jill, when it comes to uh, media entertainment, Jill mentioned and talked about these hyper-local use cases. Uh, if you think about it, the Netflix example is a customer saying, my creatives are in LA. I want to provide something in LA. Is AWS in LA? Uh, other customers could be in Miami or in Vietnam or where have you. And that hyper-local use case is only one of the, uh, of the faces of ads. The other one 
is distributed computing, where you need to be in multiple places where your end users are. And, oh, this works now. One of the, <laughs> one of the poster childs of distributed computing and distributed edge is gaming. As games become more and more responsive and um, have higher requirements and become more performant, um, gaming companies want to provide better experiences to the, to, to, to the gamers wherever they might be. And these experiences require lower latencies, sometimes lower than 30 milliseconds or even lower, depending on the game and how interactive it is. Especially when it comes to competitive multiplayer titles that require also a level playing field between different uh, gamers, then you, you start to think that if I'm a gaming company, I need to be everywhere. And AWS is expanding very aggressively to be in most places, but it's not everywhere yet. <laughs> <laughs> so what these customers can do is they can use customer, uh, products as, like Outposts, um, like Riot has done, to deploy AWS in areas where AWS is not present at. So Riot, with their um, uh, new title, Valorant, were, were under very strict deadlines to not only build the game, but also deploy it in a worldwide manner. What they did is they took outposts, uh, and they had um, a deployment of four different outpost deployments across three different countries that provided their developers the same consistency that, like we talked before, and allowed them to deploy the, the, games, uh, the game servers in the same uh, with the same uh, experience across all of these uh, locations. And this is where our approach to, to, to the area becomes super powerful. I've heard from gaming customers that they are able to extend their own game in a new location within a single afternoon. And that's what we find um, very powerful. But of course, media and entertainment, just one of the, uh, uh, of the verticals, there is a lot more that customers are doing today. So, Jill, what are we going to talk? Oh, gonna, you have another oh, yeah. Let's talk about. Sorry, <laughs> let's talk about. Uh, <laughs> since we are on the outpost, we <laughs> insert it here. We, I wanted to insert it to show you some of the innovation that we have been doing uh, over the last two years. We launched outpost two years ago. So, some of the innovation that we have been doing over the last two years on outpost, we launched with uh, Amazon EBS, EC2, all of the classic networking features like VPC, et cetera, but you could also run container services like ECS and EKS, and um, things like EMR to, uh, to process data locally. In 2020, that was in 2019, in 2020, we worked in bringing more and more of the AWS uh, breadth of the platform onto our outposts, and we launched things like Elasticas and application load balancers, but very importantly, S3, so that you can also store your data locally in an object uh, format. In this last year, in 2021, we continue to work hard on, our, on the Outpost product and deliver things that customers wanted, such as VMware on Outpost. One of the key use cases of Outpost is having it in your data center and building a hybrid experience with your current deployments and on AWS. So VMware on AWS Cloud running on Outpost was super important for customers. Um, we also expanded with, uh, with more database services, with RDS, uh, support for SQL Server, and um, importantly, uh, some features like EBS local snaps, sub snapshots, so that when you're running your EC2 instance and you want to take a snapshot, it can stay local to your data center. These, if, you, if you look through these features, they enable the use case that we've been talking about. Oh, I need my data to be within a geography or within a data center. That's, that's how this helps you. The last thing that we also did on Outpost this year is continued expanding the, in more places that you can buy and install Outposts. Um, we've reached now with five additional countries launched this week. We are now at 65 countries. You, know, you can't have a distributed edge system across the world if you're not in many countries. And that's a, an area where we're going to continue to work on and we're going to continue to expand. So Jill, can I pass it on to you now? You can. <laughs> Let's talk about manufacturing. Yeah, well, that's a, it's a really good segue that talking about outposts and uh, manufacturing, because many of the use cases and applications for manufacturing are being delivered on the infrastructure that, of course, uh, often needs to be on premises, not on the factory floor, either for latency needs or, like George talked about earlier, for data residency issues. So 
So let's uh, take a look at some of these use cases that are enabled by high performance edge services. Um, the first one, QA automation with computer vision. So of course, um, being able to automate quality control through use of computer vision is going to require real-time processing of massive continual video streams. And you're going to need a, a lot of power in able to do that. The second one is uh, logistics. Logistics can be made much more efficient using things like autonomous guided vehicles directed by computer vision software. That's a pretty interesting case, and I'm gonna take you a closer look at how all the different components, when George showed you the continuum there, of how Edge and the region come together to um, deliver, deliver solu that solution. The next one, um, predictive maintenance, being able um, to uh, bring in and crunch all of this data that's coming from sensors on the factory floor and detect potential failures and perform predictive maintenance. And finally, um, improving qu product quality by using digital twins requires visualization of large 3D data sets that are both data and graphics intensive. And that's where all of our uh, GPU powered instances um, speci uh, sp especially for AI and ML, available in the edge is really important. So it's clear that these use cases I just talked about are going to generate massive amounts of data that need to reach high performance and ultra low latency compute. Now, there's some issues there, though, because in order to do that, you also need to be able to bring together, um, have the, uh, the legacy networks, enterprise networks today, that connect these applications to users and devices, whether they be Ethernet or enterprise uh, Wi-Fi. They're suffering under the increased strains of these massive workloads. And enterprise Wi-Fi also has other challenges, such as reliability, performance, and coverage. So what is public MEC and private MEC, and how can that play uh, a role here? So mobile MEC is mobile edge computing. And when we combine that with 5G technologies, it can address both the challenges of having the right compute and the networking challenges I talked about um, with with the, uh, the Wi-Fi network not being able to keep up with these workloads. So depending, so depending on which use case, we see both public MEC and private MEC solutions. But what does that mean? What is a public MEC solution? So public MEC is ideal for use cases when mobility and connectivity to the end device um, is needed beyond the factory floor. So we call this public MEC because it's using public 5G networks to access the edge compute in the AWS Wavelength Zone without ever having to leave our Wavelength Partners Network. So you get the low latency and the mobility with the, um, the intensive compute. Now private MEC is, is different. Private MEC is addressing some of the challenges of uh, enterprise Wi-Fi with private cellular networks using 5G technologies. Now, there's a few different options here, and George is also going to talk about one. Um, so private MEC uses local, hyper-local compute, so AWS outposts. But it also needs to have compute for that private network, because you have the mobile core function that has to uh, reside locally as well. So there's two different things you can do here. You can have one outpost for private MEC that's running both mobile core and the smart factory applications. Or some people for private MEC choose to have a third party solution to host that mobile core and outposts provide that local compute. Oops, let me, so let's take a look now, if I can get back. Um, at how, uh, how f for some uh, use case like autonomous guy vehicle, how they would use private MEC 
and put all these pieces together. So on the factory floor, that's where with the private networking, you're gonna have your radios connected to the, the mobile core that's in the outpost, um, in, in the outpost on premises there. We also can run the um, computer vision application on AWS, uh, uh, for this application on AWS out outposts. Um, what that's doing is it's taking the sensor, the, the flow, the video flows that are coming from the automated guide, autonomous guided, guided vehicle and processing all that data there on outposts. So what you have now, so on the outposts you have your, your core, you have your applications, and then you still can also take advantage of that local compute to run other um, uh, parts of your manufacturing applications there. Finally, you can be sending data sets. So you can process a lot of the data for the uh, autonomous vehicle um, can be processed right there on the outposts, or you can send some of those data sets back to the region. So this kind of gives you a high-level overview of how all these pieces are coming together um, to deliver smart manufacturing and private mech. Now, um, we're actually doing this with a partner. Um, I'm Mike Bell, Senior yes, Vice Verizon President and, and General Manager Sorry, of Corning Optical Communications. Our plant in Hickory is one of the largest optical cable manufacturing plants in the world. This cable forms the backbone of today's telecommunications networks. For any manufacturer, process control, that's monitoring and correcting defects, is one of the biggest day-to-day -day challenges. The second big challenge is throughput, you know, having materials flow through a factory as fast as possible. At our Hickory plant, we're working with Verizon and Gasalt Robotics. That's a service provider for intelligent industrial automation, running highly scalable edge services on AWS Outpost that provide autonomous navigation and advanced environmental sensing as a service. Gasalt Robotics solution uses computer vision and machine learning to process sensor data received from autonomous mobile robots, then send those commands to the AMRs over ultra low latency, high throughput 5G networks. What's powerful about the combination of 5G and edge computing is the latency combined with the ability to really process data, uh, large amounts of data in real time. They're moving the computational power from the device to the edge, and that allows us to manage and process that data from multiple robots, multiple sensors, and catch problems before they occur. I think it's exciting to consider how this technology will enable us as well as other manufacturers to better harness the data being collected on the factory floor. If we can capture that data, process and interpret it more efficiently, we can see things that we couldn't see before and we can quickly send commands back to associated devices. All these things lead to better flow of goods within the factory. This project, by combining AWS Outpost and Verizon 5G Edge, we're able to improve safety, precision, efficiency, and explore the potential of 5G in a manufacturing setting. And if you open up the full power of the internet on these devices and these processes, I just think it's incredible uh, what we're going to find we can do. So another great example of how customers are leveraging the power of the AWS platform together with um, our telco partners to deliver completely new applications. And we've seen um, thus far how most applications can run in the region, but then you have, as an AWS customer, access to local zones where in, in, <coughs> um, in cities and metropolitan centers or industrial centers where you need to deploy your applications. We've seen wavelength which essentially brings the power of the AWS platform within the 5G network. And we've talked about outposts and some of the outposts um, work that we have been doing to get more features and, and, and more locations to our customers. But a lot of our customers have also applications that require less compute. They, are, they require less compute in more distributed fashion. And that's why this year we announced, uh, we launched uh, AWS Outpost 1U and 2U servers. So the normal Outpost rack is a pretty normal big rack that you can deploy in your data center or like Riot did in a distributed fashion across uh, many places. And I hope you had a, a chance to get a glimpse of that down at the Expo Hall. But um, 
What we also had this year in the Expo Hall was the Outpost 1 U and 2U servers. There are these cute but very powerful uh, smaller uh, versions of Outpost. Um, <clears throat> they are, you know, 1U is, and 2U is the standardized rack heights uh, of these racks. They are, um, they are both na uh, fitting 19 inch wide cabinets. And the only difference is essentially in, in, in physical form factor is that how deep they are. The 1U is 24 inches deep, uh, um, while the 2U server is 30 inches deep. They deliver different amounts of compute as well. The, the 1U server is based on AWS Graviton 2, the processor that gives you 64 vCPUs, 128 um, gigabits of memory, and um, at four terabytes of local NVMe storage. And then you have the 2U server, which is basically a double of that based on Intel, um, on the Intel Xeon Ice Lake processors, and gives you 128 vCPUs, uh, 256 gigabits of memory, and eight terabits of local NVMe storage. We're now uh, accepting orders for these um, and shipping them to customers uh, for fulfillment in, in, in the first quarter of 2022 across 49, um, 49 countries. So we've talked a lot about how we can deliver compute for customers to build their applications at the, uh, at the edge. However, one, area, one thing that we haven't touched as much is that networking part. Another really important use case for customers, increasingly so, is how do I connect this, uh, this extremely large number of devices that more and more kind of like pop out there? As everything starts to get connected, our forklifts, our uh, tablets in, in, worker, in, in worker hands running around war, uh, warehouses, um, cars, uh, automated trucks, robots, sensors of any sort. If you look at manufacturing floors, campuses, if you look at the convention center itself, you look around, you quickly realize how much more we get connected and how much more data we keep pushing around. So in order to do that, customers, usually in order to do that performantly and in a reliably way, usually will, um, will employ wired networks that are very reliable, but they, they quickly become impractical, impractical, impractical <laughs> when you are trying to serve more and more devices and the more the devices become wireless and mobile. So customers fall back into Wi-Fi solutions and Wi-Fi is a great, cheap, uh, cost-effective and simple technology to deploy. However, again, as you push more data around and as your number of devices reaches thousands, uh, you reach the limitations of Wi-Fi. And Wi-Fi itself as a technology is not great at covering really large open areas. You need to add more and more access points. They are difficult to, they are difficult to maintain and you have to have poles, especially in, in open areas in order to put them higher up. You can see some of those in, in, in this room. So what customers really need is the, they need to be able to leverage the power of mobile networks. And of course, 5G mobile networks, which is the latest technology in mobile networks. They need to do that because they, they need to provide low latency and high throughput improved performance to these thousands of devices. They need to cover very large spaces, whether these are indoors and outdoors, warehouses, mines, campuses, and so on. Uh, but they also need to be, as these, these use cases become more and more an enterprise and manufacturing driven, they need to be able to, to deliver advanced features like advanced security or traffic groups where you can, you can tell your network to prioritize traffic from a certain device and deprioritize traffic from other devices. And of course, they need to scale to more and more, and they need to be able to not only um, host their existing devices today, but they need to be able to look five years in the future and know that the network that they have in their hands will, will cover their needs, their future needs. Although cellular networks, mobile networks are very powerful, traditionally they are pretty hard to build. Um, you have to first you go and upfront design and plan. Um, and you need to provision usually for peak capacity. And when you're looking at these five-year horizons, that peak capacity might drive your current utilization of the network to very low levels, making it um, less cost-effective. 
you also traditionally need to integrate across different providers, whether they are hardware providers, everything from access points or where you run your smarts of the network, uh, all the way to the software and how it plays together. And not only you need to procure and connect and integrate these different components, you also need to deal with different pricing models of each of the vendor that is giving you the, uh, the, the separate component. And you know, it, it turns into a pretty hard uh, job to do. Uh, and of course, you need to have a team now that integrates and maintains the network and makes it work day by day. Um, and of course, when you need to scale up, you need to probably go back and do that all over again. And that's, that's no fun. So from the AWS perspective, we wanted to help all of these enterprise customers with a better solution. And one of my favorite announcements of this week, AWS Private 5G. AWS Private 5G is a fully, a fully managed service. It's easy to install, operate, and scale. Um, the experience that we aimed here is cost-effective and dead simple. And I think that we, we got close to, to our vision. All you have to do is go to your AWS console as an AWS customer. You give us a few information about what the network looks like, things like where do you want to deploy it, how many devices, give or take, you want to support what's the throughput and coverage area that you have in mind. And what we'll do is we'll ship to your location all of the required hardware that you need to just hook up to, to build your network. Once you power, power in and hook up those devices, the, uh, the, the, that hardware, um, the, the network self-provisions, automatically integrated across all of the hardware and software that is building the network phones back home to the AWS region and, uh, and just builds up itself. All you have to do is take your SIM cards that we also um, ship to you and pop them into your uh, 5G devices. And there you go. You have a fully operational private 5G network in a few very simple steps. What's more here is because this is a fully cloud-based network, you can use a lot of the platform features of AWS. Identity and access control is one of the key ones because it ensures your security. You can control how and who has access to what very easily, and you can visualize it, visualize it in the AWS console. But also, like most AWS services, the pricing model is extremely customer friendly. There is no hidden fees. There is no per devices fees. You can start very small, and you can scale, and you can pay as you go and as you scale. The service is really de designed to be agnostic of spectrum. It can work on different spectrums, but in its default configuration, it will work in CBRS, so basically the unlicensed spectrum that anyone can use. But you, you know, for customers that have purchased rights to licensed spectrum, they can bring their own spectrum. Uh, and also we're working with a number of um, telecommunication providers worldwide to create bundles on licensed spectrum in, in, in different countries. The hardware, is really you know, what we call the small cell radio unit. It's basically your, your radio unit. It's like the antennas and the, um, and the processing. Um, it's the SIMs that you will have to put in your devices. And um, we're also going to ship you, depending on the mode of your network, we, we can ship you an AWS managed device that can be based on an AWS output server. So you see how things come together. Um, all you need to provide as a customer is the internet backhaul. Of course, this thing needs to connect back to the AWS region for management and configuration. Uh, and you know, some uh, obviously uh, utilities locally and um, the, any customer you know, equipment that you have locally and the uh, NIP DHCP server in order to connect it to your, to your current network and to your ISP to talk back home. So we talked, a little, we talked a lot about delivering compute. We talked a little bit about delivering private networking, and I'm really excited about what our customers will do with the private 5G networks and how they can start having them. You know, I was talking to a customer yesterday about ordering for their own use in their home. They just wanted to play with it. They, they just wanted to get started, and you can do that. When you can start so small, you can do that. But also, you can scale out to full manufacturing uh, facilities. We've worked with customers. Um, we've worked with the Amazon fulfillment centers to deploy that in a, in a full fulfillment center. You know, the warehouses where when you order online in you know, Amazon, all of your orders get fulfilled and, and 
kind of uh, sent. Uh, these are really large spaces of hundreds of thousands of square feet of indoor and outdoor space, and how do you cover that with Wi-Fi, and how do you maintain it when you need to uh, when you need to maintain it and you need to shut down operations so that a person can come and fix an access point. With much fewer access points and much more scalable network, you can do that a lot faster. So we've talked about that breadth of services that we're bringing to customers to enable them across all of the use cases. However, it would be amiss if we weren't thinking about how to build, how to help customers deal with, these, with the new challenges that a distributed use case, a distributed um, workload um, uh, brings and uh, hyper-local deployments um, uh, raise for them. These are new challenges that we have to have developers, uh, we have to help developers um, uh, deal with. So creating a community of developers, application builders, but also partners is a key part of how we aim to do that. But I'll, 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 I'll give that over to, to Jill to yeah, tell us a little bit great. more about it. Yeah, as George said, um, We've been working this last year, uh, with, especially with uh, helping to accelerate bringing solutions and new use cases to Wavelength. So we're right now focusing on getting the, a hold, uh, growing this library of developer tools and infrastructure that's going to create the building blocks and makes that easier so that you take care of the undifferentiated, undifferentiated heavy lifting through some of their solutions. So for example, NetFoundry has integrated with Wavelength Zones uh, to provide um, builders a managed zero trust private network uh, in, into the Wavelength Zone. Um, another interesting one is Rafi. They've developed a deep integration with uh, Amazon EKS and Wavelength. And what they're doing is providing a managed Kubernetes operations. And so by, by creating this library of developer tools and infrastructure, um, we're, gonna, we're making it easier and faster to put those, for builders to bring those together and create their own applications. So for example, Amp Media has a web RTC streaming platform that they brought to Wavelength. And that was used by Multicasting IO to demonstrate enhanced real-time video stream events for live events. So, wavelength, so with Wavelength, Multicasting uh, saw a 40% increase in the performance in this live event. We're also uh, doing the same thing on, on um, Outposts. So last year, we announced our Outpost Ready program. Um, this is actually, it's not exactly the same thing, it's actually much more rigorous. So uh, with Outpost, they're giving you a validated solution offering. So the 72 solutions that have been validated and are part of the Outpost Service Ready program have gone through a whole certification process and have a check by our um, solution architects. Um, and, it, you know, George talked about our new launch with the servers. We're already um, working with a number of these um, partners to qualify their solutions on our new 1U and 2U servers. So we've covered a lot here today, talking about all the ways our customers are using edge compute to deliver new innovations and real business values. Um, but I think what we're most excited about is how we can you know, hear from you and understand um, what, we, what more we can do to innovate with you in 2022. So I'd like to um, open it up to any questions of anything that we went over today. Um, if there's, uh, is there, I don't know if there's a mic, if there's questions here. Yes. Yeah, I, I think I just mentioned um, the fulfillment centers and how we're working with the AWS private 5G service to equip fulfillment centers. The reason that you know, they find it useful is the, these are hundreds of thousands of square feet. Um, a single small cell radio unit on, on 5G can cover 10,000 or more. So you can have a, a handful. You know, if I'm looking around in here, we have seven 
Wi-Fi just to cover us. Imagine if you want to cover a space 100 times as big as this one with Wi-Fi. It's hard. So uh, Amazon Fulfillment Center are working with us uh, in order to keep the, these mixed open and closed spaces with, Amazon, uh, with AWS Private 5G. Think of all of the, I don't know if you've seen pictures, there is a number of robots moving around and you know, bringing people um, uh, the, the goods that they need to ship. There is um, manufacturing, uh, there is uh, packing lines you know, with uh, uh, packing belts. There is a number of folks moving around picking items, trucks coming in and out, either you know, delivering or taking uh, away um, goods. And all of this needs to work in, in harmony together and it needs to work performantly together, but also you know, for the safety and the performance of, you know, the safety of everyone and the performance of the fulfillment center, it's to be highly reliable. Every time you need, to, 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 you need someone to come in and bring a ladder to go change an access point, that's not only cost, but it's also disruption of operations. We see that not only on Amazon, but with other customers as well. We've been working with Koch Industries, for example, for similar uh, use cases. They are also using AWS Private 5G for, for you know, a similar 